bro. All right. Um, well, welcome back to the Adobe Sign Five Star Signature Lounge. Uh, today with us we have Jim Dickey, uh, co-founder and uh, fellow at the CSO Insights, mm -hmm. and which is now part of Miller Hyman's Independent Research. Is that correct? Yeah. For the last two years, we've been the independent research arm for Miller Hyman Group. And how have you enjoyed making the change from you know being independent to actually being an independent arm of Miller Hyman? It's really kind of broadened our capabilities to do things. You know, we've been able to broaden our number of analysts. Uh, Tamara Shank, probably the number one person in the world in sales enablement, is one of my colleagues now in Wiesbaden, Germany. Uh, Chris Patton's joined us. We have really solid sales operations skills. So we've kind of broadened our reach. Plus, we're able to go out and tap into 177,000 people who are part of the you know, Miller Hyman you know, Training Society. So we get a lot of new data coming in from all around the world to really have a global perspective to what we're doing, not just a U.S. perspective. Excellent. And for those of you who might not know Jim Dickey, you might you might know Miller Hyman. But Jim Dickey is a world-class leader when it comes to the research you provide in, in sales benchmarks, best practices, understanding how we need to be working not only in, in sales cycles, but in, in methodology and coaching. And so some of the best research I've ever come across has been from you. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate in fact, it. That's, that's how I met you. <laughs> yes, it is. Was well, something that I had read about that you talked about that I wanted to implement in, in the organization I was working at and I reached out to you and you were more than gracious to give me some of your time and that's something that I've never forgotten. Well, I appreciate it, Jake. You know, we've been, for the last 25 years, we've really focused on how do we bring more science to the art of selling. One of my favorite Deming quotes was, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Yeah. And so what we're really trying to bring is, is data to sales leaders, to sales people, to really understand how do we optimize what we do going forward based on what we've done in the past. Well, we talked about some of this research, and I, I'd love to go back and talk about the some research this year, the 2017 World Class Best Practices that you released. Yes. And in there, we find an interesting data point around how close rates are dropping. In fact, over the last five years, we've seen a, a significant drop, and now this last year, you found it has dropped to 53% of the sellers are actually attaining quota. Yeah, and to put it in perspective, back in 2012, the number was 63%. So that's a significant drop, and it's a steady erosion down there. Um, and interesting enough, when we've done our compensation studies in the past, and we've asked, what percentage of your sales organization are you expecting to hit their number so your company hits your number? That number is 70%. So I expect these 70% to hit it. 53% are actually doing it. What are the odds of me hitting my number as a chief sales officer? And that's what's keeping a lot of not just CSOs, but CFOs and CEOs awake at night. Yeah, and, and so what do we need to be focusing on then? If, if this is a challenge that keeps occurring, are we, are we prepared for this? Or is what we've been doing not working anymore if it just keeps dropping and dropping? Well, I think what we've got to start doing is finding out why. You know, what's happening out there? I, I, I totally get that if there was ever a time when sales was easy, now is not it. Mm. But what's hard about it? Where, where's the breakdown? You know, as part of our sales enablement studies and part of our world-class best practices studies, we always ask, so where are you investing your money? You know, what problems are you going to try to solve? And top of the list last five years has been, we need to optimize lead gen. We need to get more stuff into the funnel. And I go, well, yeah, that's yeah. a problem. Is yeah. that your biggest problem? Because another part of the study that we did is we went out and we asked companies to say, okay, what happened to deals at the end of the funnel? Not at the top. Those things that got into the forecast. What happened to forecast deals? And the win rate of forecast deals came in at 47.3%. Can I ask you a question on that number? You hear sure. that number change a lot, depending on different you know, points of, of research I hear 47% from you, then you hear 33% from others, and it really, what, where, where's the discrepancy in this number and what should we really be focusing on to make sure we understand that right? The thing that we really focus on is the idea of not pipeline but forecast. Forecast is when you're committing that the deal is going to close. So you're probably in the quote to close process, mm -hmm. you know, really down there kind of at the end of the, of the rainbow type of stuff. And, you know, to put that in perspective, I was speaking at a cloud computing conference in Vegas. I'm presenting those types of numbers. I'm leaving during my keynote, and I go from the convention center back to the hotel. You have to go through the casino, which is huge at the RE. And I must have looked like a deer in the headlights because I'm going like, how do I get out of here? And one of the employees comes up, and we just strike up a dialogue. And he ends up telling me that he runs the craps tables. And so he says, are you going to bet? And I said, not planning on it. He gave me a chip to go get some free chips. And he said, go over to my area. And he said, why? He says, best odds in Vegas. I said, doing what? He says, make a pass bet. The odds of winning are 49.3%. Oh. And I remember just cracking up going, wait a minute. 
The odds of winning in Vegas are better than closing a forecast that, by the way, we created. I mean, when something gets on the commit list, at least the salesperson and his or her manager believe it was going to close, and we're wrong more than half the time. That, to me, is a huge problem. So and I think if you would look at oh, all man. the things you're doing, say, let's go find a problem we're solving. Because if I could increase win rates by 5%, it would have a huge impact on revenues versus increasing the number of leads by 5%. Right, right. It, I can't get it out of my head. So odds of winning in Vegas are higher than winning with my sales team. Yeah. And that's, by the way, not a sales management level discussion. That should be a boardroom level discussion. How do I run a business if I can't trust the forecast? How do I, as a CFO, manage lines of credit? How do I, as a person who's running HR, handle staffing? If I'm the VP of manufacturing, how do I know what to build and when? So we've really got to go back and get much more visibility into that process because it's not just a sales issue, it's an entire enterprise issue. Okay, then let's go, let's go back to this topic of quote to close. Let's drill deeper. You touched on this. What are we missing along the buyer journey of this quote to close process that we need to be focusing in on to improve what we're doing? How can we fix this? I think we are back in the 80s in terms of how we're handling the quote to close process. You know, I started selling for IBM about that time. Right. And we had a process where, okay, you're going to fill out the contract. We didn't have email back then, so we would drop it in the mail to a customer. And I've lost all visibility. So the contract's there, it's got all the T's and C's in it, it goes out to the customer. Where is it? Right. I have no idea. Today, I email it out to the customer. Where is it? I have no idea. And by the way, we used to talk about this concept of go find the economic decision maker, that one person who can make the deal happen. That doesn't exist anymore. When we've done our studies right now, we're finding that it's somewhere between four and five decision makers involved in signing off on that thing. Now, some of them may just be reading it and passing it on. Some may right. need you know, to initial it. but. They're going to do that. And by the way, they may have influencers that they work with. And so, hey, can you check this out and see if this sounds right to you? So it may be on somebody's virtual desk, and I have no idea, out at the customer site, or it could be on our virtual desk. You know, I've gone and asked for a discount that requires it to go to not just my boss, but my boss's boss. Or it's high enough that the changing in term and condition is going to go to the CFO. So we're down to the last, you know, you know, the final things at the end of the quarter. I have no idea where the deal is. And that's acceptable. And by the way, then when the deal comes back in, I work with a computer company that has a joke that no sale goes unpunished. All right. Because as soon as I close something, I, I stop selling for three days because I know the paperwork is going to be processed wrong. So I've right. got to kind of shepherd it through the organization to make sure that we get revenue credit and I get commission credit. Okay. And I'm just going, you know, we're in an age today where there's tons of technology, there's tons of ways of routing things, but we're doing things the way we did it 40 years ago, and that's absurd. Mm -hmm. So what do we, you know, what do we need to be thinking about different to solve these problems? What kind of problems do we need to be solving then now? I think we need to sit there and say, if it was in the perfect world, what would better look like? And wouldn't it be better, you know, I always talk about a friend of mine came and used an example. He says, what would you pay Federal Express if when you gave them the package to deliver their customer, they sat there and not only delivered it, but they stood there and they waited for him to open it. And they gave you feedback on, okay, the guy opened it and he read through it right away. Or he opened it and he put it over here on this big to-do pile. Or he sat there and put another in another off of envelope to go over to somebody else to deal with. And you say, you pay these guys a fortune. Well, we, we can do that today with technology. We can go back through and be tracking those things. So we've got to start saying, if we were designing the process all over again, I would want to know where the thing is. I would want to know who's approving it. I would want to know if people are agreeing with it or not. I would want to know when it came back that I don't have to do everything. Everything else is going to be updated. CRM is going to be updated. ERP is going to be updated. Customer service is going to be updated. So let's just go conceptually redesign this the way it should work in order to free up salespeople time and improve the process. And then let's go figure out a way to put together processes and technologies to do that. So this is a complex process. I mean, this is, a, like you mentioned, there's multiple decision makers. Yep. There's multiple touches. There's multiple champions on this deal and there's multiple steps that has to move through through this and yet we need to be informed along the way but is there technology that's helping with this how can we how can we stay informed and, and to be in front of this to help guide our buyers through the process well, I think there, there are definitely technologies you know Delphi Science a great example of something that starts to go through and streamline that whole process that I can sit there and say whose virtual desk is this thing on has it been approved? 
you know, so that you know, I'm going to get pressure from my manager saying, "Is this thing where? When's this thing coming in? You know, it's the 30th. Tomorrow's yeah. the 31st. Is it going to close or not?" And to be able to not just start calling around to everybody, going, hey, "You got it? Where, where is it?" Is to be able to know, "Here's the person that's the holdup right now. It's in legal, and I need to go to get the legal guy to move on." Or it's in our thing. It's been, been sitting in you know the CFO's thing, and they haven't signed off on it. So I think it's just the idea of utilizing technology to be that smart digital assistant, if you will, for the salesperson, the sales manager, where it's kind of monitoring everything all along the way and helping me, you know, get the information I need to do my job of. If I need to do some more persuading, if I need to go in there and explain the the value prop or whatever, let me know who to go talk to. So you got me thinking about something about the complexity of this process, mm -hmm. the the need for having visibility more than ever on all the steps that's happening, and the, the, really the burden that's putting on the seller. But our managers, our coaches, equipped are they doing the right things they need to be doing to help guide their sellers through this as well? I think there's a lot of things going on right now where managers are managing and coaching based on hunches versus metrics. Mm. And by that, I sit there and say, Jake, how's the deal going with ADP? And you go, it's going great, Jim. Yeah, yeah. And I got nothing. <laughs> you yeah. know, I got, I got nothing but your self-reported behavior. Yet, I think that you could do a lot of things. If you started saying, let's take a look at, has there been a meeting scheduled with your chief champion for the last week of the month? No, okay, how to do that. Are you sending out emails to the customer? Yes, I am. Great, are they responding to the emails? No, they're not. Okay, I need to coach you on that. Or, you know, I've left five voicemail messages, but nobody's returning my calls. And I can start tracking activity today. There's new AI technologies that would sit on top of this that would give manager visibility into here are the deals that are at risk, here's how I go work with people, but I'm not calling up the sales guy and going, how's the deal going? I'm calling up the salesperson going, you know what? The CFO's not looked at the terms and conditions yet. And in the history of our company, we've never had anybody sign a contract without reading it. So can you call the CFO yeah. and get them to start checking and find what's going on? Are they on vacation or whatever? So I pinpoint exactly where the coaching needs to occur. But I'm doing it based on knowledge that I've never had by simply asking you, how are things going? So we're no longer betting on Vegas odds no. when we approach it like this. No, and I think it's that type of thing where if you start to get that visibility, into deals, you can realize, you know what, this deal's gonna push out to next quarter. And so as opposed to doing an unnatural act and saying, let's apply a discount, can I take a look at another deal that actually I've got forecast for next month, but it's ready to close now, and I bring that deal in and I swap them. Because you know that way I can maintain not just the revenues, but I can maintain margins, because I'm not discounting as a way of getting somebody to do an unnatural act. It's interesting. Well, Jim, for those of us that love and follow you and for those who have not known of you but now are excited and want to follow some of the things you're doing, can you give us a sneak peek? 2018 is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. We're wrapping up this year. What are you working on right now that you're excited about? The two things that my partner Barry Twyler and I are doing is, you know, I'm a technologist, that's been my background. I got in the software industry when Informatics was the biggest software company in the world at $90 million. Mm -hmm. So this is not blonde hair, this is gray. Um, <laughs> it looks good, Jim. But what we're focused on is where can you utilize technology to optimize that whole customer lifecycle management process, okay. specifically around things like AI technology. Yeah. And what we're finding out there is the technologies are there to really fundamentally redefine the processes we use to work with customers, but it's also going to change who's going to be successful selling. And I think we've got to start taking a look at what are the competencies that sales people need, that sales managers need, because it's going to be a totally different world two years from now when all the technology is giving us insights into everything that's going on in the world of sales and how to better engage customers. I think that's going to be the exciting transformation to watch. So when that research comes out, where can we find it? We're going to be publishing that as part of our standard cadence, you know, the world class best practices study comes out every every beginning of the year. We do a sales management report later on, sales enablement reports coming out. We're doing the sales ops report. And also we do a whole series of webinars. We're going to be doing one in a couple of weeks on managing the risk at the end of the sales funnel. So I invite everybody to sit in on that if they're interested. But we're constantly trying to provide information back to sales organizations. Well, Jim. <coughs> Thank you so much for joining us today in the uh, Adobe Sign Signature Tea Lounge. We really appreciate having you here and we love working with you. So thanks for coming. Thank you.